Hi, everybody. Welcome to Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda, and we're going to talk about Josephus and the Old Testament canon. This is part two of a three-part series. If you haven't checked out part one, I highly recommend it, because we look at the passages involved in Against Appian 138 through 41. And what we showed in the first video is that the typical interpretation, which I call the canonical interpretation, that believes that Josephus is giving a 22-book canon actually imports an awful lot of baggage and things that simply are not there in the Josephan text. So this raises the question, if he isn't singling out the 22 books as a canon, then what is he singling them out for? And that's what we're going to answer in this video. We're going to take a leisurely look at Against Appian. We're going to look at his arguments and purpose. And then from that, we're going to go to the passage in question, 38 through 41. And I'm going to show you what Josephus really is talking about in terms of the 22 books. And here's a spoiler alert. It has nothing to do with the canon per se. So without further ado, why don't we begin the Apocrypha Apocalypse? the best place to begin is to start off with the passage that is frequently quoted in terms of Josephus giving a 22 book canon. It's found in sections 38 through 41 of Against Appian, book one. And for this series, I'm going to be relying on uh, John Barclay's translation of Josephus that's published by Brill. And it reads as following, quote, among us, there are not thousands of books in disagreement and conflict with each other, but only 22 books containing the record of all time, which are rightly trusted. Five of these are the books of Moses, which contain both the laws and the tradition from the birth of humanity up to his death. This is a period of a little less than 3,000 years. From the death of Moses to Artaxerxes, king of the Persians after Xerxes, the prophets after Moses wrote the history of what took place in their own time in 13 books. The remaining four books contain hymns to God and instructions for people on life. From Artaxerxes up to our own time, every event has been recorded, but this is not judged worthy of the same trust since the exact line of succession of the prophets did not continue. So this is the passage where the canonical interpretation insists that Josephus is giving a 22-book canon, a list of inspired scriptures, and he sets it apart from later writings which are not canonical, not inspired, and not read by prophets. That's the typical interpretation. But is that really what's going on in Against Appian? Well, to answer that, we need to learn what is the purpose of Against Appian, and how does Josephus prosecute his case for the antiquities of the Jews? Let's begin with a little background. Before Against Appian, Josephus wrote two works. One is the Jewish War, in which he participated in, and the second work is known as the Antiquity of the Jews, or just Antiquity. Now, this is a comprehensive historical overview of Judaism, beginning with creation all the way up to Josephus' own time. And it's really this work, the Antiquities of the Jews, which is the focus of Against Appian. So let's let Josephus explain what the problem is, beginning in the very first paragraph. Quote, through my treatise on ancient history, that is antiquities of the Jews, he continues, I considered that to those who will read it, 
I have made it sufficiently clear concerning our people, the Judeans, that it is extremely ancient and had its own original composition and how it inhabited the land that we now possess. For I composed in the Greek language a history covering 5,000 years on the basis of our sacred books. However, since I see that a considerable number of people disbelieve what I have written on ancient history, but adduce as proof that our people is of a more recent origin, that it was not thought worthy of any mention by the most renowned Greek historians. And then he continues in paragraph three, I thought it necessary to write briefly on all these matters and to instruct all who wish to know the truth on the subject of our antiquity. So the purpose of against Appian is that there were some pagans who said that his work on the antiquity of the Jews was without foundation. It wasn't sound. Their main reason was because the most renowned Greek historians didn't mention the Jewish race until recent times. And so they concluded, based on their trust of these Greek historians, that Judaism was recent, and therefore Josephus' work on antiquity is simply not worthy of credit. So what Josephus sets out in Against Appian is to destroy this claim. And to do so, he does it in several steps. The first step is he's going to try to knock the legs out of Greek historiography and show that Greek historiography is not very trustworthy, and it's certainly inferior to other cultures, such as the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Phoenicians, and also the Judeans. Then, after he shows the defects of the Greek historiographers, he shows the superiority of these non-Greek cultures. And then finally, he goes to Jewish historical writings and shows the superiority of Jewish histories over that of the non-Greek histories. And it's really within that context when he's talking about the superiority of the Greek histories and how their soundness is unquestionable that he talks about the 22 books. But before that, we need to follow his thread of argument. So first, let's look at his criticisms as to why Greek historiography is not capable of dismissing the existence of the Jews in antiquity. Josephus brings up the following points. The first reason why Greek historiography is deficient is because Greece is in a climate that is unstable and it's prone to catastrophic events. And when these catastrophic events occur, all memory of past time is wiped out. As he says in paragraph 10, the region of Greece, on the other hand, has been affected by numerous catastrophes that have wiped out the memory of past events. And since they were repeatedly reestablished new ways of life, the people of each period thought that their time was the beginning of everything, unquote. Note also that the repeated destruction by these cataclysmic events and the rebuilding and recording of history makes Greek history discontinuous and sporadic. And this is going to be an important point later on. Point number two, Greek historiography is rather recent. It's not very ancient. Josephus argues in 1.7, for everything to do with the Greeks, I have found to be recent, so to speak, from yesterday or the day before. I mean, the founding of cities, the matters concerning the invention of arts and the recording of laws. And just about the most recent of all of them is the care in relation to the writing of histories, unquote. So Greek historiography is actually the latest, the most recent of all the arts and inventions of the Greeks. He continues, those of their number who attempted to write history, I mean, such as Cadmus the Milesian in Argive Akusalas and others that may be cited after him, lived only a little before the Persian invasion of Greece. Josephus' second point is that Greek written historiography 
is very recent. In fact, the earliest occurs shortly before the Persian invasion of Greece under Xerxes. This is going to be an important point, so keep that in mind. The third and perhaps most damning point for Josephus is the fact that Greek culture did not prize record keeping. In fact, the Greeks don't have very many ancient writings at all, much less history. For example, in paragraph 20, it says, quote, from the outset, the Greeks did not bother to create public records of contemporary events, and this above all supplied to those who subsequently wanted to write about ancient history, both error and license to lie. Later in paragraph 45, he says, quote, for they regard these stories as invented at a whim of their authors, and they are right to think this, even with regard to the older authors, since they see some of their contemporaries daring to write accounts of events at which they were not present and about which they have not troubled to gain information from those who know the facts. And this is a very important point for Josephus. Not only are there no ancient Greek historical records, which subsequent historians can rely on. And this is the cause, he believes, of Greek histories contradicting and criticizing and accusing each other of lying. But the fact is that the later historians were not present at the events they record. Contemporary history for Josephus is the best history. And in fact, this is why he considers his own historical works to be superior. And you can see this very clearly later on in Against Happy when he says, I, on the other hand, have written a truthful account of the whole war and its individual details, having been present myself at all the events. So there's no ancient records that later historians can rely on. And even the more recent Greek historiographies, the authors were not present at the events that they record. So he sees this as a, a giant defect. For this reason, he says, since they don't have any primary source material to rely on, Greek historiographers rely on supplementing that lack with eloquence and rhetoric. As he says in 15, quote, is it not absurd then for the Greeks to puff themselves up as if they alone know about antiquity and accurately transmit the true account of it? Can one not easily discover from the authors themselves that they wrote without reliable knowledge of anything, but on the basis of their own individual conjectures about the events? Indeed, for the most part, they refute each other in their books and do not hesitate to say the most contradictory things on the same subject. In 23, he notes, quote, it is then the absence of any previously deposited record which would have both instructed those who wish to learn and refuted those who lie, that accounts for the extent of disagreement among the writers. So Greece is in an unstable climate. It's wiped out by catastrophic weather. Number two, it's not ancient. The earliest written histories come shortly before Xerxes' invasion of Greece. Number three, because of this, there really isn't contemporary history, which Josephus believes is the best kind of history. And also because there is no original uh, works, later Greek historiographers are forced to conjecture and rely on their own eloquence and try to make their claim to fame by ridiculing or accusing others of lying about past events. In other words, it's a giant cacophonous group of historical writings. And contributing to this is the fact that Greek historiography was unregulated. Anybody could write a history for the Greeks. We will see this emphasized later when Josephus starts talking about non-Greek writings. Josephus's case against the reliability of Greek historiography is because unstable climate. Written histories are a recent event. They're not ancient. They didn't keep contemporary records. And so there's no source material for later historians, which results in a cacophony of different opinions. And part of the reason also is that historiography was not regulated within Greek culture. So anybody could write at a whim at any time, whenever they felt like it. Josephus then turns his attention to 
non-Greek cultures that the Greeks themselves recognize as having a very sound, stable recording of history, namely the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, the Phoenicians, and eventually the Judeans. So now here he's going to argue for the supremacy of the non-Greek cultures over the Greek cultures in terms of their ability to record history. First, these other cultures, unlike Greece, lived in a relatively stable climate. So they weren't wiped out by catastrophes. You see this in 1.9. So they're superior to Greek historiography on that point. They also are much more ancient than Greek histories, as Josephus notes in paragraph eight. However, they certainly themselves acknowledge that matters to do with the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, and the Phoenicians. For the moment, I'll refrain from adding ourselves to this list, enjoy extremely ancient and extremely stable tradition of memorialization. Also in 28, he says, quote, that among both the Egyptians and the Babylonians from extremely early times, priests, and in the one case, were entrusted with taking care of the records. Not only did they record history, but Josephus points out that Unlike the Greeks who didn't prize the recording of history or recording of events, these cultures not only produced contemporary records by people who witnessed what was done, but that they did this continuously. And therefore, they leave a comprehensive view of history. As we just read, that these cultures enjoy an extremely ancient and extremely stable tradition of memorialization. And then in the following paragraph, he says, for these all inhabit places which are least subject to catastrophic events of climate, and they have applied great forethought to leaving nothing of what happens among them unrecorded, but to have them consecrated continuously in the public records composed by the wisest individuals. Now, notice the emphases here that not only do these ancient non-Greek cultures live in the stable climate, but what? They have a culture which continuously records. And he states this twice. First, negatively, he says that they leave nothing of what happens among them unrecorded. And then he states it positively, but have them consecrated continuously in the public records. So there's a continuous production of contemporary histories in these non-Greek cultures. And because they're continuous, obviously they're comprehensive. Later in regards to the Phoenician culture in 28, he says, the Phoenicians in particular who used writing both for managing daily life and for transmitting the memory of public events. Since everybody agrees about these things, I think I may pass them by. In other words, the Phoenicians daily use them for the daily management and also for recording of records. So that is another reason why non-Greek historiography is superior to Greek. It's stable climates, they kept records, in effect, they prize keeping records and they kept it continuously, daily, constantly, and they recorded everything and left out nothing. For Josephus, contemporary history that records everything and leaves out nothing is the gold standard. It's far superior to Greeks. Moreover, these non Greek cultures regulated exactly who was allowed to record history. 28, he states that among both the Egyptians and the Babylonians from extremely early times, priests in the one case were entrusted with care over the records and conducted philosophical inquiry on that basis. And the Chaldeans, in the case of the Babylonians, and that of those who were in touch with the Greeks, it was the Phoenicians in particular, who used writing both in managing daily life and for transmitting the memory of public events. So in other words, they designated priests and wise men 
to be historiographers. It was restricted, or rather it was regulated. Again, that was another fault with the Greeks. The Greeks were unregulated. Now, having shown that non-Greek historiography is superior to Greeks historiography, Josephus now brings up the Jews. And he shows that for the Jews, they are even more superior to even the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, or the Phoenicians. So not only did they live in climates that were stable and promoted the recording of very ancient history, but they also were regulated. So after speaking about these uh, various cultures and how they regulated the writing of history, Josephus says in 29, but that our ancestors took up the same, not to say still greater care over the records as did those just mentioned. In other words, the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, the Phoenicians all had certain regulations about who could write history. Well, guess what? The Jews had even stricter regulation. He continues, assigning this task to the chief priests and prophets and how this has been maintained with great precision down to our time. And if one should speak with greater boldness will continue to be maintained. I shall try to indicate briefly. In paragraph 30, he says, not only did they from the outset place in charge of this matter the best people and those who are devoted to worship God, but they also took care that the priestly stock should remain unalloyed and pure. So where wise men and priests in the non-Greek cultures were pointed to write down history, in Jewish culture, only the chief priests and the prophets were in charge of taking care of the sacred histories. He also mentions at the very beginning of 37, he says, naturally then, or rather necessarily, seeing that it is not open to anyone to write of their own accord, nor is there any disagreement present in what is written, but the prophets alone learn by inspiration of God what had happened in the distant and most ancient past and recorded plainly events in their own times just as they occurred. So within Jewish culture, only prophets could record history, which is much more strict than even the Chaldeans, the Egyptians, and the Phoenicians. And certainly, just the fact that they even regulate it, it's more than Greek historiography, according to Josephus. So he continues by pointing out that Jewish history is even more extremely ancient than Greek history. In fact, the whole reason why the prophets alone could write was because they learned through inspiration what happened in the most ancient times or the most ancient past. This is clearly a reference to Moses, the quintessential prophet. If you think about it, how did Moses know what took place in Genesis 1 and 2 during creation when there weren't any human beings around to observe it? Well, he learned this through divine revelation. God told him what happened. In fact, God filled in the most ancient past. And so in that regard, what he recorded is of extreme veracity. And also Moses wrote about what occurred during his lifetime. As for those who wrote after Moses, Josephus says that they recorded plainly events in their own time, just as they occurred. So prophets who wrote history after Moses were contemporary histories. They were contemporary historians writing about what happened during their own time. This brings us up to paragraph 38, which is the passage in question about the 22 books. So what I'd like to do is slow down, and we're going to look at this line by line and see how all this fits into what we have just laid out. Paragraph 38 says this, quote, Among us, there are not thousands of books in disagreement and conflict with each other. Now here, of course, he's talking about the Greek histories. He says that it's unregulated. So there is numerous uncountable books that the Greeks have written in terms of history, and they conflict with each other because they're not regulated. So he says, unlike the Greeks, we don't have thousands of books that are in disagreement and conflict with each other. No, we have only 22 books 
containing the record of all time, which are rightly trusted. We'll leave aside this really strange phrase that he says. He says that the 22 books contain the history of all times. Well, obviously, the 22 books don't contain the history of all times. History continued after Artaxerxes, and Josephus knows that, obviously. So what does he mean by the 22 books containing the history of all times? Well, let's put that in our back pocket. We'll address it a little later. But I think uh, once we lay out our case, you'll see exactly why this is an important little phrase. Moving on, which are rightly trusted. The word translated trusted, pistuo, is the same Greek word that's often translated as believe or faith or accredited. Now, in the first video, I showed how there's an English translation that was made by William Whiston that is extremely popular, probably the most accessed translation of Against Appian is through the Whiston and how Whiston used the defective Greek text that included things that were not originally part of Josephus. And the first one we pointed out was that in his text, he adds the word divine so that it reads, we're rightly believed to be divine. Now, in that context, faith or trust are credited to a divine source, then that gives faith more like the sense of an ascent of faith, religious faith, where if divine is not part of the text, it really doesn't have that sense. And so that's a great example of how the Wiston translation really biases the reader into reading a canon into these texts where it's not there. And of course, divine is not part of the original text. It was an addition through Eusebius. So with that in mind, let's look at how Josephus uses the word pistuo and also its opposite, apistuo, disbelief. Right at the very beginning in 2, he says, however, since I see that a considerable number of people pay attention to the slanders spread by some out of malice, and disbelieve what I have written on ancient history. So you can see disbelief here is not the refusal to give a religious assent to the text. Disbelief basically means that they did not hold his work on the antiquities of the Jews as sound, historically sound. Okay, so they don't accredit it. They don't give it value. In four, he says, quote, I will employ as witnesses for my statement those judged by the Greeks to be most trustworthy on ancient history as a whole. And here, actually, he uses a form of pistuo, which is superior. So it's most trustworthy. And again, it's, you can see it's, he's not saying that the Greeks think of these as divine scriptures or there's an ascent of faith. It's just really more that it's more sound or more trustworthy. What's really interesting is a lot later in the first book of Against Appian in section 161, Josephus actually uses the negative and positive, and he uses it in the same context of uh, what we're dealing with here. He says, quote, however, it is necessary to satisfy also the inquiry of those who disbelieve the records among the barbarians and seem fit to believe only Greeks. So here you actually have the apistuo and pistuo, belief and non-belief, the same word that's used in section 38. Notice again, it's not giving a religious assent. That's totally foreign from the context. As you can see here, obviously they disbelieve the historical records of the barbarians, yet they see fit to believe only Greek historians. Again, belief and unbelief is in regards to the historical soundness of the material. In 39, he says, five of these are the books of Moses, which contain both the laws and the tradition from the birth of humanity up to his death, a period of a little less than 3,000 years. Now, again, this harkens back to 37, where he's talking about inspiration and how God reveals to the prophets the most ancient past. Obviously, this is including Moses here. Five books of Moses are able to record 3,000 years of history, and the fact that much of it is not contemporary history is made up for from the fact that it's divine revelation. 
Next, he says, and from the death of Moses until Artaxerxes, king of the Persians after Xerxes, the prophets after Moses wrote the history of what took place in their own times in 13 books. The remaining four books contain hymns to God and instructions for people on life. Now, notice the emphasis here that the 13 books written by prophets, these different prophets were writing contemporary history. And again, we saw that in 37 where he includes that along with divine inspiration. But notice also throughout the argument how contemporary history is a premium, that the non-Greek cultures all wrote contemporary records. They had a consistent, constant memorialization of events that occur. That's kind of what he has in mind here, that these, each of these prophets wrote about what occurred in their own time. And in the previous video, I pointed out that that description is problematic because if you're trying to read into this description, the category of the prophets, you run into problems because not all the prophets wrote about contemporary events. Continuing on, he brings up the termination date of Artaxerxes, which he says is the Persian king after Xerxes. Why does he terminate at Xerxes. Well, for one thing, the 22 books terminate with Xerxes, but this is very important for his argument. Why? Well, he notes that Artaxerxes is the successor to King Xerxes. Hint, hint. Now, remember earlier on, we noted that the first written histories that Josephus talks about, the most ancient ones of the Greeks, began shortly before Xerxes' invasion of Greece. So he says, look here, in the Jewish histories, we have 22 books written by prophets, contemporary historians that span the time from the creation all the way to Artaxerxes, who is the successor to Xerxes, the very king who invaded Greece and also marks the beginning of written Greek history. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the whole idea of against Appian. Appians and others claim that the Jews could not be as ancient as Josephus claims in his Antiquities of the Jews. Why? Because the Greek historians don't mention their existence. And so what Josephus does, he said, fine, let's look at when is the earliest written histories of the Greeks. It takes place a little before the invasion by Xerxes into Greece. And he says, you know what? We have 22 historical books written by prophets, contemporary prophets, contemporary historians, who chronicle everything from the beginning of the world all the way up to the successor of Xerxes, Artaxerxes. So there's no way you can claim that we didn't exist before this time. Hence, he nails his argument right there. And this record is solid. There are exactly 22 books that record this time period and also some other books such as hymns and instructions on life, which shows that they existed like we saw in the very first paragraph. He says they were extremely ancient and they had its own original composition. So that's where all his guns are pointed to, establishing and vindicating what he had written in antiquities up to the earliest Greek historians right before the invasion by Xerxes. And he shows, he vindicates Jewish history by showing that they have exactly 22 books that actually go past Xerxes to his successor. Now, for those histories that were written afterwards, this is outside of his purview. So he only devotes a few lines towards it. And this is actually a very crucial thing for the canonical interpretation. Well, let's read the line first. 41 says, From Artaxerxes up to our own time, every event has been recorded, but this is not judged worthy of the same trust, since the exact line of succession of the prophets did not continue, unquote. Again, very important line for the canonical interpretation. What's he talking about? Now, remember, the canonical interpretation reads this and says, this is what Josephus is doing. He's distinguishing the 22 canonical books from all the books written after that were not canonical. 
He's distinguishing between inspired books and those that are not inspired from prophetic books and those that weren't written by prophets. Does this line support that view? Well, let's see. Let's go through it part by part. He states that from Artaxerxes all the way to his own time, quote, every event has been recorded, unquote. Now, I want to table this just like we did with the phrase earlier, and I'm going to suggest that this could be a clue as to what he's talking about. So we'll skip over the idea that every event was recorded. He says they're not judged worthy of the same trust. Again, the same idea, the same word, believe, is used just like it was used earlier. And what we saw in the context of against Appian, belief here is not believed as sacred scripture. It doesn't receive the assent of faith or anything like that. What he's talking about in terms of soundness as historical documents. So he's saying that the latter historical documents are not of the same caliber in some sense than the 22 books. So we'll have to see why is it not of the same caliber. Is it because it's inspired? Is it because they're not inspired? Is it because they weren't written by prophets? Well, Josephus tells us, he says, since the exact line of succession of the prophets did not continue. So they're not of the same caliber as the 22 because of the failure of an exact succession of prophets. Notice he doesn't say that they're not the same caliber because they weren't written by prophets. Well, if he said that, then he'd be contradicting what he says in 37, that only prophets could write history. So not only would he contradict himself only a couple of paragraphs earlier, but he also undermine his own case. Because remember, he made a big deal about how the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, the Phoenicians all had regulated historiography. In other words, not everybody could write. They either had to be priest or wise men with Judaism as chief priests or prophets. And then he says only prophets could write. He also doesn't deny that there could be a succession of prophets. What he denies is that there is an exact succession of prophets. Now, somebody may say, well, hold on a second. There could be a way in which you could read this where he does deny that it's written by prophets. And that's if an exact succession is necessary to continue the gift of prophecy. In other words, if you conceive of succession like a person to person, or in this case, a prophet to prophet succession, kind of like a dynastic succession, then it would follow that if the dynastic succession isn't exact, it breaks down, then the subsequent writers would not be prophets. The gift of prophecy would not continue. So if one link in the chain is broke, the rest of the chain is unhooked. It's not the same as the former. And really, if you hold on to the canonical interpretation, I think this is your only bet. But there's a huge problem with this person-to-person, prophet-to-prophet, dynastic kind of succession idea. There are many, many problems. For example, Nowhere else in Against Appian or any of his works does he ever talk about a succession of prophets. So we're not really clear what exactly he's talking about when he says exact succession of prophets. But if Josephus believed that a dynastic like person to person gift of prophecy was passed from one to another, like the canonical interpretation seems to suggest, well, then certainly he could only have learned about it in the 22 books or the proto-canonical books. But here's a problem. Nowhere in the proto-canonical books do you find any indication of an ongoing, continuous, person-to-person, prophet-to-prophet, dynastic-like succession. Now, it's true. You do find sometimes succession, such as the case with Moses uh, handing on his authority to Joshua. And you also find Elijah handing it on to Elisha. But that's about it. You just don't have this exact chain, dynastic, person to person, passing on of a prophetic gift. And here I'd like to quote Tobias Mullins. Mullins explains, there were times where no prophet was to be found in regards to which the use of the word succession would be an abuse of language. For from Joshua to Samuel, a period of 300 years, the only person who is mentioned as possessed of the prophetic spirit is Deborah, Judges 6-4. In the early part of Samuel's career, there could have been no prophet, quote, 
for the word of the Lord was precious in these days. There was no manifest vision, unquote, for Samuel 3.1. And when the three children were surrounded in the flames and fiery furnace, among the many national calamities they deplored was the want of a prophet. And this is according to Daniel 3.38, according to the Theodosian version. So Mullins is saying, look, if you look at the proto-canon, you don't see anything like an exact succession of prophets or prophecy. What you find is huge gaps. So it's impossible that anyone could use the word succession in a reasonable way to describe the ongoing passing on of the prophetic gift from person to person to person to person, which the canonical interpretation needs in order to work. In fact, Josephus himself speaks of a period of distress when the prophets ceased to appear in Israel as taking place during the Babylonian captivity. Therefore, there's no evidence in the protocan, the 22 books themselves, or in the works of Josephus, including against Appian, that he believed in a person-to-person dynastic-like succession, where if it breaks down at any point, there's the gift is lost. It's just not there. So what did Josephus mean when he said that the exact line of succession of the prophets did not continue? So in the context, we already saw that Josephus already spoke about how prophets alone could write sacred histories, receiving inspiration from God from the most distant and ancient past, recording plainly the events in their own time. Now follow this. Since prophets record contemporary events or history, a succession or a continuous succession of history writing prophets would produce a continuous succession of records of the contemporary events. Seems pretty straightforward. If you have an exact succession of contemporary historians, they will produce an exact succession of contemporary histories. And if you do not have an exact succession of prophet written histories, you don't have an exact succession of contemporary events being recorded. It's as simple as that. And earlier we saw that Josephus prizes the idea of contemporary histories but also that there is a continuous ongoing recording of contemporary histories that produce a comprehensive memorialization of historical events. We saw in 8, 9, and 28 this being emphasized by them, that they have an extremely stable tradition of memorialization, that they leave nothing of what happens among them unrecorded and continuously in the public records composed by the wisest men and how the Phoenicians used writing both for the managing daily life and for transmitting the memory of public events over and over again. Unlike the Greeks who didn't bother to write history and record it in the most ancient times, these cultures and especially the Jews continuously recorded a continuous and comprehensive historical narrative for the 22 books. However, when we get to the end of the 22 books around our Xerxes, things change. You don't have continuous contemporary histories. What you have is it becomes a bit sporadic. Josephus knows this because he wrote Antiquities, which was based on the sacred books of the Jews. So after he comes to Artaxerxes, suddenly his history becomes a bit discontinuous. Now here I'd like to cite I believe one of the foremost experts on Josephus, Mason, who says regarding Josephus's work of antiquities, says, quote, as soon as he's finished with the biblical narrative at the time of Artaxerxes, immediately thereafter, Josephus briefly summarizes the high priestly succession from the following century, and then jumps ahead to Alexander the Great, who appeared, quote, at about this time, unquote, a century later, the chronological gap papered over by this characteristic phrase. And then he concludes, the chronological unevenness of the remainder of antiquities alerts us to Josephus's personal knowledge that his continuously connected sources up to this point, the records are exhausted, unquote. So what Mason's saying is if you read antiquities and you see how Josephus is forced to meld together these patchwork of things, that Josephus knew that once you reach Artaxerxes and the end of the 22 books, 
that history becomes discontinuous, it becomes sporadic, it's disconnected. This, I believe, is what Josephus means when he says that the exact succession of prophets ceased. The failure of the exact succession of prophets come from his awareness that after Artaxerxes, his continuously connected sources, like Mason explains, ceases, and the sources become discontinuous and sporadic. So it's not a difference between inspired histories and non-inspired histories, sacred histories, non-sacred histories, even prophetic histories and non-prophetic histories. The difference is between a continuous, contemporary, comprehensive recording of history versus a non-continuous, contemporary recording of histories, both of which were written by prophets, according to Josephus. Now, let's go back to those two things that I asked you to set aside that we discuss later. Let's talk about them now, because I think that Josephus hints at this distinction very subtly. So I don't want to put too much emphasis, but I want you to be aware of this. According to Josephus, the 22 books are said to be containing the record of all time. And we said that doesn't make sense because the 22 books do not record the record of all time. They, they're not uh, comprehensive of everything that happened in Judaism until he wrote against Appian, obviously. So what does he mean? Well, the books written after Artaxerxes, he describes it a little differently. He says, from Xerxes up to our own time, every event has been recorded. So in regards to the 22 book, he used the word Pantos, and in 41, he uses a different word, Hekistos, according to Little and Scott's lexicon of Greek, all in each severally. And here, actually, I think Whiston does a good job translating hecatos as very particularly. What I think is going on here is that Josephus says that in the 22 books, all the history within this period is recorded. In other words, it's comprehensive. Where with the histories after our Xerxes, it's individually severally within a whole. In other words, it's discontinuous. Now, I don't want to put too much emphasis on this, but I think that he is making this distinction here in the passage, although it's quite subtle. Therefore, the reason why the post Artaxerxes histories are not of the same caliber as the 22 books isn't because it's not inspired, isn't because it wasn't written by prophets or even a succession of prophets, the reason is because the 22 books have a continuous contemporary historical record, a continuous narrative that is all-encompassing for the period. In fact, it's overlapping in some cases. But that the latter writings are written by prophets. They did receive revelation. They did plainly record what happened in their own time. But the exact succession ceased, and so they're discontinuous. They're sporadic. And therefore, they're not of the same caliber as the 22 books. There's no doubt that the Jewish race existed before Artaxerxes because of this comprehensive record. So if Josephus is going to sneak in, well, there are some Jewish histories that aren't regulated, that undermines his whole case. I mean, that was a distinctive of Jewish culture, just like the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, and the Phoenicians. So that is the answer to why these 22 books are set apart and said to be superior to later historical works. That being said, there's still another argument that I think furthers this and shows that our interpretation of these passages much better coheres with the whole of Josephus's works than the canonical interpretation. And that's going to be the topic of the third part of the series. So I hope that you found this helpful. And please um, hold off your judgment until you see all three videos. And please look up these passages, read against Appian, get a good translation of it, read it, check it out for yourself. Thank you.